Okay, so this is some work I've been doing with my colleague uh, Marcel Franz at UBC, uh, postdoc Carmen Romani, and a graduate student, uh, Zhao Yu Xu, for whom I don't have a photograph, unfortunately. Uh, okay, so let me try to motivate the model. Uh, so uh, this is a, uh, a very simple model of one-dimensional interacting fermions, and uh, it's kind of a cousin of two very familiar models of interacting one-dimensional fermions. And in some sense, the models get progressively simpler. So uh, we could start with a so-called Hubbard chain model. So now we have a chain of fermions uh, with uh, on-site Coulomb interactions. Fermions have spin on-site Coulomb interactions. Uh, and uh, th this model has been studied. Uh, uh, it's, it's been kind of a theoretical obsession for many years. And people have studied it by beta onsets, field theory, numerical technique called density matrix normalization group. Uh, and it's been quite useful to understand this model. It provides insight into higher dimensional models. Um, it contains purely on-site Coulomb interactions, which is a, a big approximation. Uh, another model, uh, which looks even simpler, d discards uh, spin. We have spinless fermions. If we have spinless fermion chain, uh, they actually can't have on-site interactions by Fermi statistics. So the shortest range interactions we can have are nearest neighbor. Uh, and uh, this model has also been studied very extensively by all the same methods, and uh, again, it maps onto XXZ uh, spin chains, uh, and it's also been uh, quite useful for understanding behaviors of some actual one-dimensional systems and also uh, higher dimensional models. Uh, so uh, we can kind of cut in half the number of degrees of freedom again. So you might think the model would get even simpler. So instead of having uh, one spinless fermion uh, per lattice site, we can have half a spinless fermion per lattice site in a certain sense. So we can introduce uh, so-called Majorana fermions. Uh, so th these are fermionic operators that equal their own Hermitian conjugates. So we can combine two Majorana fermions together to make a Dirac fermion. Uh, so we can think of basically a Dirac fermion operator has a Hermitian and anti-Hermitian part, and these are both Majoranas. So in a sense, we've cut the number of degrees of freedom in half again. Uh, but now, uh, basically because the product of uh, two Majorana fermions is one, uh, to get a non-trivial interaction, we actually have to write something on four neighboring lattice sites. So th this is the shortest range possible interaction you can write down for uh, Majorana fermions in, in one dimension. So it's a four Fermi uh, interaction. Uh, so, well, you might think these models are getting simpler and simpler. We have fewer and fewer degrees of freedom. But actually, uh, unless we miss something, this model is, it was quite a bit more challenging. Uh, one of the reasons is it, it doesn't have uh, any conserved particle number. There's no conserved U1 here. Uh, it's not beta onslaught integrable as far as we know. Um, but uh, we were able to study it using field theory methods and numerical techniques. And I think we have a pretty good understanding of the phase diagram. Uh, so is there some experimental motivation for this model? Well, uh, apart from my and fermions being sort of uh, trendy these days, uh, there have been some uh, concrete uh, proposals. Uh, and uh, maybe the most uh, direct one involves uh, uh, a vortex lattice. Uh, so in a superconductor, uh, so let me show you the picture. So we, we have a strong topological insulator. We, we put a, a superconducting film on top. We apply a magnetic field, and we get a vortex lattice. And uh, it's expected uh, that at the core of every uh, vortex, there will be a Meyer on a fermion. Uh, and uh, in general, there can be tunneling processes, so particles can hop in between the vortex lattices. And in general, there could also be uh, interactions. Uh, probably longer range than the shortest one I've written down, uh, but that's a, a kind of simplified uh, starting point. Um, and uh, it's also interesting to notice that an extra symmetry is present in the Hamiltonian uh, when the hopping term vanishes. Uh, it's uh, basically it uh, takes gamma j to minus one to the j uh, gamma j. Uh, and this symmetry is actually present uh, when the chemical potential of the topological insulator is tuned to the Dirac point uh, of the surface states. So th this means that it might be possible to actually tune the hopping term to zero. And therefore, it might be possible to study the sort of strong interaction regime where the interaction term is much larger than the hopping term. OK, so uh, that's the model. And uh, uh, let me uh, tell you what we've managed to understand about it. Uh, so the first thing to notice about this model, which makes it a bit more challenging, is that unlike the Hubbard model, it's quite easy to understand in the limit of very strong coupling. And, and so is the spinless uh, Fermion model. Uh, if we kind of ignore hopping and only consider interactions, the models become uh, fairly trivial. We can quite easily solve them exactly. Uh, 
Uh, that's actually not the case with the Majorana Fermion model. Even, even with purely interaction terms, uh, the model is not so trivial to solve. So uh, after scratching our heads about this for quite a long time and doing some numerical simulations, uh, we came to the conclusion that there is a, a spontaneously broken translational symmetry in the strong coupling limit. Uh, so to get some insight into what might happen in that case, it's uh, instructive to uh, break this translational symmetry by hand. So we can consider a model where the hopping term uh, varies, uh, alternates, and also where the uh, interaction term alternates. So if we have an even number at sight uh, on the left-hand end, we have G1. If we have an odd number in sight, we have G2. And these are uh, nearest neighbor interactions. So in, in fact, to get, get a model that even I can solve uh, easily, uh, I'm actually going to really cheat drastically and set three of these parameters to zero. So suppose we only have one uh, non-zero parameter, namely G1. So now we have a model that we can finally uh, easily solve. Uh, and the way we solve it actually is to combine pairs of Majoranas to make a Dirac. So if we combine together uh, the Majorana on site 2J and the Majorana on site 2J plus 1, so as, as promised, the Hermitian and anti-Hermitian part uh, forms a Dirac operator, uh, then uh, it can be shown that this uh, nearest neighbor product, in fact, is just uh, twice uh, this number operator, C dagger J, C J uh, minus 1, an operator with eigenvalues plus or minus 1. Uh, and therefore, uh, in this case, well, this product is, is gives uh, uh, one number density, and this gives the next number density. So now, in fact, it just reduces to this. So this, this actually looks like the uh, strong coupling limit of the spinless fermion model. But we only managed to get that by throwing away half of the interaction terms, actually. Uh, so th this model the solution is very well known. Uh, and actually, it depends uh, strongly on whether G1 is positive or negative. Uh, so if uh, G1 is uh, positive, uh, then uh, we'd like to make this number positive. So either uh, all sites are uh, empty or all sites are occupied. So this would be like a, uh, in the analogy of a spin problem, it's like a ferromagnetic state. Uh, if we think of the empty site as being like spin up and the filled site as being spin down, it's like a ferromagnetic state. Other hand, if uh, G1 is negative, we get a charge density wave. So uh, we like to have electron, no electron alternating, which is like an eddy for a magnetic uh, state. So uh, actually, I've already kind of cheated by uh, sort of breaking the symmetry by hand and throwing away half the interaction terms. Now, now we discover that uh, there's kind of a second spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, and we have a twofold degenerate ground state even after we've uh, thrown away half the interaction terms. Uh, so if instead uh, we have G2 non-zero instead of G1, uh, we get uh, basically the same picture, except that uh, now we combine Majoranas to make Dirac's on site 2J minus 1 and 2J instead of 2J and 2J plus 1. Uh, and now we basically uh, get the same picture. Uh, so uh, we can sketch, let me just sketch a little picture of what these ground states look like. So the most important thing to remember is it takes two Majoranas to make a Dirac. So uh, the little dots represent the original lattice sites where the Majorana fermions live. And uh, the big uh, circles represent how I've combined a pair of Majoranas to make a Dirac. Uh, and if uh, G1 is negative, then as I said, we want to have this charge density wave type state, uh, which can either be this form or that form. If G2 is negative, uh, something similar happens, but everything shifts over by one Majorana site. So now we combine these two Majoranas to make a Dirac and these two to make a Dirac. Uh, so, uh, actually, if I'm right that we have a spontaneous symmetry breaking when G1 equals G2, then we might actually expect uh, four ground states. Uh, so they, they differ. Translation by one site sort of shifts how we're combining Majoranas to make a Dirac. And then once we have Dirac's, so we can kind of understand what's going on, we still actually have uh, another twofold degeneracy. Uh, on the other hand, uh, for G bigger than zero, again, we have four states. Again, we have two ways in combining Majoranas to make Dirac's, but now we have this sort of ferromagnetic situation, so either all states empty empty or all states occupied. And again, uh, we only define Dirac's by combining pairs of Majoranas, so there's sort of two, two ways of doing it. Okay, so that's what happens if we just consider interaction terms. And I've kind of really cheated you because I haven't really shown that this translational symmetry is spontaneously broken. I'm just kind of assuming it for the moment. Uh, we might ask what happens if we include the hopping terms. Well, if we only have T1, uh, then again, we can uh, write it in terms of uh, Dirac fermions. And now it just looks like a simple chemical potential term. So this will actually split the degeneracy between all states being filled or all states being empty. It will choose uh, one or the other. Um, and um, 
So there's actually, there's a particle hole symmetry present when t equals zero, uh, which actually makes all states filled are empty degenerate, but it's broken once we include t. Uh, so uh, if you consider the case where t1 equals t2 and g1 equals g2, so full translational symmetry, uh, then um, these ground states are sort of simple candidate cartoon pictures for what the ground states might actually look like. Um, so if we take the case, for example, where t1 and t2 are, are non-zero, and g1 and g2 are non-zero, uh, then depending on the sign of t, we're either going to favor the state where everything is empty or favor the state where everything is filled, but we still have a two-fold degeneracy because we can translate by one site, we can switch the way we combine uh, Majoranus to make Dirac's. So uh, for G positive, we might expect that if we turn on a small t, uh, we might split this particle hole degeneracy uh, and um, either have the one or the other of the ferromagnetic uh, type states. And this we expect to be a kind of a first order uh, phase transition. Uh, so we might expect the energy difference to, to uh, vary uh, linearly with this uh, parameter t. Uh, and also a, a jump in this uh, ferromagnetic order parameter. So this is rather like applying a magnetic field to a ferromagnet. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, g is less than zero, so now we're back actually to uh, this situation, uh, this, this, uh, actually this situation here. Uh, now if we turn on a small t, well it favors uh, all states being uh, filled or all states being empty. But on the other hand, we have this nearest neighbor repulsion, which actually prefers a kind of alternating state. So uh, in this case, we expect that actually the fourfold degeneracy will persist uh, up to some finite value of t, uh, where eventually it uh, sort of dominates over the nearest neighbor repulsion. Uh, and uh, so it's like a commensurate incommensurate sort of transition. We'll, we'll move away from, from here in some smooth way as we crank up the hopping term, which actually prefers either filled or empty states. OK. Uh, so uh, if, if, uh, if, like me, you have trouble getting any intuition about my runner fermions, uh, we can always write this Hamiltonian in terms of Dirac fermions uh, by arbitrarily combining pairs of Majoranus to make Dirac's. But, uh, well, we get some of the terms that I mentioned. We get, we get this type of uh, nearest neighbor repulsion term. We have this chemical potential term. Uh, the other hopping term just, just becomes a hopping term for Dirac fermions. But then uh, the other interaction term is rather nasty. Uh, so this term involves uh, three lattice sites. Uh, there is a, a hopping term that, a second neighbor hopping term that depends on the, the sign depends on the occupancy of the intermediate site. And there's also a pairing term. So this Hamiltonian does not conserve particle number. Uh, it's, it's not a conserved symmetry of the Majoran and Fermion model. So we have this uh, peculiar uh, second neighbor pairing term where the sign again depends on the density of, of the uh, intervening site. So uh, particle number is definitely not conserved here. But uh, like in most uh, models like this of superconductors, it's conserved modulo two. So uh, the, the Hamil Hilbert space breaks up into sectors that either have an even or odd number of fermions, uh, and we call this fermion parity. And we can define a fermion parity uh, operator, which will be plus or minus one on all uh, lattice sites. So when we classify the states of the Hamiltonian, we can classify them by uh, their fermion parity. Uh, so uh, we also have a spatial parity symmetry. And uh, when, when t is zero, we actually, we can change the sign of uh, every fourth uh, Majorana, uh, and that changes the sign of g. So this means that positive and negative g have to be equivalent when t is zero, but actually not uh, for non-zero t. Uh, finally, you might wonder uh, what happens at the edges. Uh, so what, one of the interesting aspects of Majoranas is they can sometimes appear as edge states at the ends of chains. So here, of course, we have lots of Majoranas, so we probably don't care too much if we have some at the end or not. But you might ask, if we're in one of these spontaneously broken phases, uh, do we have unpaired Majoranas at the end? Uh, well, actually we could or could not, depending on how we combine Majoranas to make Dirac's. And uh, we suspect that energetically, probably this state is preferred over that one, because we've, we, we've combined more Majoranas and got more Dirac's this way. So probably this state has lower energy. So if we're in this kind of spontaneously broken gap phase, we probably don't have any Majoranas at the end, we suspect. Okay, so so far I've just been waving my hands and speculating about spontaneous symmetry breaking. Uh, which, uh, in fact, we believe happens in the strong coupling limit. So now let me go back to the opposite extreme. Let's see if we can s solve the model for weak coupling. In particular, let's see if we can solve the model for zero coupling and then uh, add uh, uh, perturbation. Um, 
So uh, without loss of generality, I can take T positive and consider uh, both signs of G. Uh, and now the idea is to perturb in, in the limit of weak interactions. Um, and uh, there's kind of a confusing sign reversal here because of the way we wrote the Hamiltonian. So actually, it turns out that G less than zero uh, really corresponds to repulsive interactions, and G bigger than zero is attractive interactions. And I apologize, but it sort of comes out of minus signs in writing the Majorana interaction. So let, let's start with a non-interacting case. We just have the, uh, the hopping term. In fact, I should go back and show you something about that. If you look at this uh, T term, uh, there's actually there's a hopping term. There's also a pairing term. So this is actually a combination of hopping and pairing. Uh, and uh, chemical potential. So actually, it's, it's related to the uh, Katea model. Uh, but now we're adding these interactions. So the first question is, well, what's the behavior of this model uh, with no interactions when uh, the two Ts are equal? So actually, th this model, well, it's harmonic. We can solve it exactly. So all we really need to do is Fourier transform the Majorana modes. Uh, and because the gamma Js are Hermitian, gamma of minus K has to be gamma of K dagger. Uh, so uh, we can uh, write the Hamiltonian uh, this way. And in fact, uh, we can simply think of gamma of k as being an annihilation operator for some range of k, and a creation operator uh, for the other range of k using this identity. Uh, and therefore, we can actually write the Hamiltonian uh, as a standard uh, quadratic Hamiltonian in terms of annihilation and creation operators. Uh, dispersion relation is sine k, and they only exist over sort of half the Bill 1 zone uh, from 0 to pi. So we have the sine k dispersion relation. Uh, and uh, now if we want to write down a low energy theory, we can linearize the dispersion relation uh, and just keep fermions near uh, zero and pi points. Uh, and we can think of these, when we, linearize, <coughs> when we linearize the dispersion relation, this becomes equivalent to a relativistic field theory uh, with the slope here corresponding to the velocity of light. <coughs> and uh, these particles uh, basically have positive momentum, so they're right movers, and these have negative momentum, they're left movers. So that, that corresponds formally to only keeping uh, wave vectors of gamma j near zero or pi, so uniform part, alternating part. Uh, and uh, then we can write down a, a relativistic uh, Majorana field theory. Uh, so this involves actually right and left moving Majorana modes with some velocity uh, for t. So th this, in fact, is a well-studied uh, field theory in uh, high energy physics uh, because it, it's a relativistic field theory describing Majorana modes. So the three-dimensional version of this model might describe uh, um, neutrinos, for example. Um, and again, it's important to notice that translation by one site actually changes the sign of gamma left and not gamma right. And that actually forbids by symmetry the, the mass term. The mass term would be gamma right, gamma left. That's the uh, non-derivative harmonic term you could write down. With, uh, and this, this would actually gap out and provide a mass for these excitations. But this mass term is actually forbidden by translational symmetry. So therefore, uh, we expect that these excitations remain uh, gapless. Now we can try to understand the effect of the interactions. And if the coupling constant is weak, uh, we can just project them onto the low energy excitations, gamma right and gamma left. Uh, but now we already see a strange difference from uh, other uh, types of models, especially, uh, um, well, actually any of the other types of models, because uh, since we only have one, we have two types of Majoranas, gamma r and gamma l. And basically, gamma r squared is, is just a constant, and gamma l squared is a constant. So to get any kind of interaction, we have to actually stick in two derivatives. So uh, unlike the spinful or, or ordinary Dirac fermion models, uh, the, uh, the simplest interaction term we can write down already involves two derivatives. So uh, in the language of the renormalization group, this means it's irrelevant or has dimension four. We count dimension one half for each fermion, so that gives us two, and two derivatives gives us four. So uh, this means we expect that this interaction would scale to zero as we go to lower energies. So we wouldn't expect it, uh, at least if G is weak, to have much effect uh, on the physics. So this tells us immediately that we should expect a gapless, non-interacting Majorana phase to persist uh, up to a critical value of G for either sign of the coupling constant. I'm going to refer to this as the Ising phase because uh, a model of gapless Majorana fermions in one dimension, uh, in fact, corresponds to the Ising model. Uh, and, uh, uh, that's my first connection with the spin problem. And in fact, I'll come back. Turns out that the, uh, that the full Hamiltonian all its glory is actually related to a spin problem, but a rather complicated one. And if we uh, just throw away the interaction terms, uh, the spin problem just corresponds to the Ising model, actually. So uh, we might expect that at least up to some critical value of this coupling constant, and maybe all the way to infinity, we simply remain in this uh, trivial, gapless, non-interacting Majorana phase, or Ising phase, at low energies. <coughs> 
So uh, the, the question then is, uh, did my hand waving at the beginning about spontaneously broken symmetry, was it actually uh, of any relevance to this model, or did you simply get a boring gapless phase all the way up to infinite coupling? So not, I think, uh, terribly obvious, and I don't think we could have answered the question without having uh, some numerical results. Um, so let's assume for the moment that there are some sort of phase transitions uh, as we crank up the coupling constant and ask what uh, they might look like. Um, so uh, as we go to large uh, positive G, which actually corresponds to uh, attractive interactions or going into the ferromagnetic phase, uh, we might expect a, a transition uh, into the gap phase with broken translational symmetry. Uh, and once we the, break the translational symmetry, then nothing prevents a gamma R gamma L term, which is a mass term. So we would expect that we would produce a mass for these Majorana and fermions. And as I mentioned, uh, in the case of positive G, where we have the ferromagnetic states, uh, if we have a finite T, they're actually just two ground states, uh, because the, the uh, hopping term T favor is either filled or empty, so we can just translate them by one site. So uh, we go into a state with a twofold uh, degeneracy uh, if the symmetry is broken at strong coupling. So you might ask, well, what, what would be the nature of such a phase transition if it actually occurs? Uh, well, there is good reason to believe it would correspond to what's called the tricritical Ising model. Uh, and uh, the reason is that, the, well, the, the gapless phase is the Ising model. And uh, this symmetry I was talking about, uh, which is actually translation by one site in the Majorana mo model, uh, actually corresponds to a well-known symmetry uh, in the Ising model, it actually, it's not the symmetry that changes the sign of the spin operator. It's something called uh, Kramer's Vanier duality. It's a symmetry that actually uh, interchanges the low temperature and high temperature phases. Uh, or in the uh, quantum version of the Ising model, uh, it uh, interchanges uh, the uh, transverse field term and the uh, nearest neighbor interaction term. Uh, so th that symmetry is sort of naturally present. Uh, corresponds to translational symmetry. It's kind of the reason the model remains gapless or at the critical point. Um, but uh, if that symmetry is spontaneously broken, uh, then we can go into a gap phase. And this is actually precisely what happens uh, in the Ising model. Uh, so in the classical Ising model, uh, uh, there's a critical temperature where the transition is second order. But if you add uh, dilution, so take a two-dimensional Ising model and remove some of the spins, uh, then eventually the transition becomes first order. Uh, and at the point where the second order transition turns into a first order transition, uh, we have a, uh, a so-called tricritical Ising critical point. Uh, so uh, this corresponds to a conformal field theory uh, with a central charge of 7 tenths, whereas the Ising model is a conformal field theory with central charge uh, 1 half. So uh, this might suggest that for positive G over T, there might be a range of parameters where we have the Ising phase, a range of parameters with a twofold uh, degenerate ground state corresponding to breaking this kramers one duality, and then some sort of tricriticalizing uh, point at some uh, critical value of, of G. It's also interesting to notice that if you consider what happens, if you just go barely past the critical point, so you're just barely into the, uh, the phase with broken kramers one duality, you can actually analyze the nature of this phase transition. In particular, uh, there is a, um, a relevant operator at this critical point, which actually produces a gap. And it turns out this, rel first of all, the tricritical Ising model actually has supersymmetry. And it turns out that the, uh, the inter leading, irrelevant, leading relevant interaction here that, that uh, drives us into the gap phase is also supersymmetric. So we actually expect that this broken symmetry phase would be, super, be a massive supersymmetric phase sufficiently close to the tricritical Ising point. So uh, th this model provides a possible realization of supersymmetry uh, in a condensed matter context. And in fact, it's a type of supersymmetry occurs in relativistic uh, quantum field theories. Uh, so you might object, well, if it's supersymmetric on this side, why isn't it supersymmetric on that side? Uh, it, and that, that question was actually studied by, uh, by field theorists many years ago. And the conclusion actually is the operator, so if you change the sign of this coupling constant for this operator which preserves supersymmetry, uh, with one sign of the coupling constant, it, it drives you into another uh, massless phase, but with uh, a smaller central charge, but it also spontaneously breaks supersymmetry. So supersymmetry is spontaneously broken in the Ising phase. There's no real uh, ramifications of it, but it's uh, believed to be unbroken uh, in the phase with the broken kramers one duality. Okay, so, uh, well, this is all hand-waving, and uh, we wouldn't have got anywhere with this project without having some numerical simulations. Uh, so uh, 
we, we did some uh, density matrix normalization group calculations up to rather large systems. Uh, and eventually we uh, found compelling evidence that there is a phase transition, but it incurs at an incredibly small value of t over g, or alternatively an incredibly large value of the dimensionless uh, interaction strength. So uh, th there's a transition at a huge, uh, huge interaction strength. Uh, and uh, t is so small here that actually it's th we're not very far from t equals zero. So uh, for t less than this critical ratio, uh, one is in a, a gap phase with spontaneous symmetry breaking and a finite correlation length. But if you go all the way to t equals zero, the correlation length remains enormous. It's probably around 1,000. It's much longer <coughs> than the largest system we could study numerically. So this made this exercise actually uh, very challenging. Uh, so what worked most efficiently in the end was to actually look at the uh, finite size energy levels. <coughs> and it turns out that <coughs> in these um, conformal field theories, uh, every energy level sort of encodes universal information about the critical behavior. <coughs> and there's actually a one-to-one -one <coughs> relationship between the uh, energies of the states in the finite size spectrum, all of which scale like velocity over length times some number. So these, these dimensionless numbers are kind of universal numbers that contain information. And each one of these numbers actually corresponds to a critical exponent in the field theory. So there's sort of golden information contained in these numbers. And if we can extract them numerically, we can compare them to predictions of the conformal field theory. In fact, these, uh, these XNs uh, are, in general, they're fractions and, and they're, uh, they're scaling dimensions of operators. And these XNs should be different in the Ising and tricritical Ising phase. Other thing that we can do is look at the uh, central charge uh, from looking at entanglement entropy. And we found that for a, uh, uh, a range of uh, T over G, uh, central charge is, is uh, one half corresponding to Ising model. And then it, uh, it jumps to some larger value, maybe approaching 1.5, as we, which would be the value for the tricritical Ising model uh, as we, um, or I'm sorry, tricritical Ising model would be 7 tenths. So in fact, it doesn't go to 7 tenths. It jumps right past it uh, in this case. Uh, but we, we can also look at uh, finite size spectrum. And in particular, we can look at ratios of energy gaps. So here, uh, even or odd corresponds to states of even or odd fermion parity. Uh, zero or one uh, corresponds to ground state or excited state, first excited state. And uh, A just means anti-periodic boundary conditions. So uh, we can predict these ratios of uh, excitation energies. Uh, and uh, in the Ising phase, it should take the value uh, 1 half. And in the tricritical Ising model, it should take the value uh, 7 halves. And uh, what we find is that as we tune parameters, there's a sort of magic value of t where it seems to go to uh, 7 halves. Uh, for larger t, it goes very slowly down towards 1 half. And for smaller t, it has some behavior probably characteristic of having a gap, except the gap is so small that it's actually rather challenging to see it. We can look at a bunch of other ratios. So here we've actually looked at, um, I guess, four different ratios, or five different ratios, actually. And uh, all of these numbers sitting right at the critical value of t, which we think is a tricritical Ising model. And uh, actually, uh, all of these ratios are predicted uh, by uh, the tricritical Ising conformal field theory. And these are represented by the solid lines. And the symbols are numerical data. So uh, I guess we're getting actually four ratios of finite size energy gaps, all of which, uh, to pretty good accuracy as we increase the length, uh, are going to what is predicted uh, by the conformal field theory. We can also look at correlation functions. Uh, so this is sorry, alpha and beta just corresponds to gamma on even or odd lattice sites. So we, we can look at the uh, correlation function for the equal time correlation function in the ground state for the Majorana fermions, which we can calculate again using, numerically using the uh, DMRG. And uh, in the Ising phase, uh, we just expect a 1 over x uh, decay. So on a log scale, uh, we get a slope which is uh, minus 1. Uh, but uh, at the tricritical Ising point, we expect uh, an exponent actually of, of uh, 1.4, uh, or uh, which I guess is um, uh, 7 halves. And uh, no, it's not 7 halves, it's uh, 7 fifths. And uh, that, uh, that also agrees very well. So for generic values of t, we see a slope 1. Uh, and at the tricritical Ising point, we see a slope of uh, 1.4. OK, um, so now, now let me turn to what happens for g less than 0 that actually corresponds to repulsive interactions. Uh, if uh, th this model was going to actually be relevant for an experiment, you would have to decide, are the interactions attractive or repulsive? Well, if they're basically Coulomb interactions, they should be repulsive. But since we're sitting on top of a superconductor, we might hope there could be some, possibly some sort of induced attractive interactions. So conceivable either sign is of, uh, of relevance. Uh, 
But let me know, so far I've been talking about uh, attractive interactions, now let me turn to repulsive uh, interactions. So now we might ask, well, how do we exit? Again, we expect this Ising phase will be stable for a, a range of, uh, of G uh, less than zero corresponding to repulsive uh, interactions. Now the question is, well, how do we exit the Ising phase into some sort of gap phase uh, in this case? Well, in this case, they argued that for in a strong coupling limit, now we expect a fourfold degeneracy. We had this uh, antiferromagnetic type state. So we had up, down, or down, up, and we could shift everything over by one Majorana site corresponding to changing how we combined Majoranas to make Dirac. So we had a fourfold degeneracy. And that doesn't sort of look right for an Ising transition because uh, Ising, we expect a, only a twofold degeneracy. Uh, so that suggests that, in fact, this will not be a tricritical Ising transition, but something else. Uh, so uh, it turns out you can get some insight into what happens in this case uh, by considering what happens if we add a third neighbor hopping term. So I emphasize we do not have a third neighbor hopping term in our Hamiltonian, but one might be induced under renormalization. So you might ask, well, why go to third neighbor, not second neighbor? Second neighbor is actually forbidden by the spatial parity symmetry. So third neighbor is the next one which is allowed. So, well, if we have a third neighbor hopping, uh, we can again uh, just uh, diagonalize. And, and again, as we play the same game. We have to look, we get a dispersion relation like this. And again, we have to look at the range of wave vectors where the energy is positive. And we can identify those with creation operators and the other range with annihilation operators. Uh, and now, actually, we, there are actually uh, six points uh, where the energy passes through zero. Uh, they include uh, zero and uh, pi, uh, and actually four other points. So uh, again, we can sort of play the same game of mapping this on. At low energies, we only keep wave vectors near zero and pi, and also near k0 and pi minus k0, and, and the negative k uh, points. And uh, we can actually identify zero and pi with a Majorana fermion as before, but uh, k0 and pi minus k0 uh, should be identified with Dirac fermions. Uh, basically because we have states above and below zero energy that aren't obtained by reflection, k goes to minus k. So uh, this basically tells us that at least uh, ignoring interactions, the low energy theory now has Fourier modes near zero and pi, k0 and uh, pi minus k0. And uh, we can identify these with uh, left and right moving Majorana fermions and also left and right moving Dirac fermions. So again, if we only keep low energy states, now the non-interacting Hamiltonian is actually a sum of a Majorana fermion relativistic theory and a Dirac fermion relativistic theory. And one of the rather remarkable things about this is, well, the Dirac theory actually has a U1 symmetry, a conserved charge. Uh, so even though we started with a model that didn't have any conserved charge, it seemed like, in a sense, in the low energy theory, a kind of a conserved charge was emerging here. Of course, that's fairly trivial unless we include interaction effects. So then the question is, what are the allowed interactions? Uh, and it turns out that now there actually is one uh, low energy interaction uh, allowed by symmetry, which is not irrelevant. Uh, and it's a rather familiar interaction for spinless Dirac fermions and involves uh, basically a product of uh, right and left uh, currents. Uh, and this also uh, preserves the U1 symmetry. So, so we might speculate, therefore, that there's kind of an emergent U1 symmetry and that we go into a phase that has, uh, but, but this will actually lead the, leave the Dirac fermions massless. In fact, uh, this relativistic Hamiltonian with this term is, is, the, is the Hamiltonian that describes the uh, spinless uh, Dirac fermion model in the gapless phase. So this might suggest that there's going to be a, a phase where we have a gapless Dirac fermion and a gapless Majorana fermion. The gapless Dirac fermion has an interaction term. This interaction term uh, turns it into a so-called Luttinger liquid. So it's a kind of interacting massless Dirac fermion theory. Um, so uh, we actually could check this conjecture because uh, if you just go back to the, uh, the, the non-interacting part, we have these velocity parameters, V0 for the Majoranas, V for the Dirac's. Uh, and uh, in the non-interacting uh, model, uh, as we vary uh, T prime, we actually go through a critical point where extra zeros appear in the dispersion relation. And at the critical point, the velocity actually vanishes. So the critical point is characterized by vanishing velocity. So if we start in the Majorana phase and numerically calculate the velocity, uh, indeed we find uh, for g equals minus 1, there's a critical t where the velocity vanishes. So we can identify this as uh, the point where this transition might occur from a uh, Ising phase into what we call an Ising plus Luttinger liquid phase. Uh, and uh, this occurs at, at not such a tiny value of t. So in fact, in this case, uh, g over t is about one third. So this is occurring at re relatively weak coupling, whereas for the other sign of the coupling constant, the transition was occurring at a coupling of about 250. So there's enormous asymmetry between positive and negative coupling uh, in this model. Uh, 
Uh, now, if we go into this, uh, well, in the uh, Ising phase, uh, central charge is the one half. Uh, in the Ising plus Luttinger liquid phase, well, we got one half for the Majorana mode and one for the Dirac fermion, so central charge is three halves. And that agrees quite well with what we extracted from entanglement data for relatively small systems. So, uh, okay, so now we have a phase of, of uh, negative coupling where we expect to have this gapless uh, Dirac plus Luttinger liquid phase. But again, I was waving my hands about spontaneous symmetry breaking at strong coupling in a gap. So, uh, is it possible we eventually have a transition out of this Majorana plus Luttinger liquid phase uh, into a gap phase? Um, is there an interaction that would produce that? Uh, well, it turns out that uh, there is one other interaction uh, we can write down, which is allowed by symmetry. Uh, it actually involves uh, sort of a pairing term for the Dirac fermions that breaks the UN conservation uh, and a product of the Majorana fermions. Uh, but if you take into account the Luttinger parameter uh, K, uh, which we can calculate uh, from the uh, other, so this, this interaction term actually determines the Luttinger parameter, uh, and uh, we get a k less than one, which corresponds to repulsive interactions, and this actually uh, makes this interaction irrelevant. This pairing term has a dimension larger than one with repulsive interactions, and therefore this is an irrelevant uh, interaction, at least starting from weak, weak coupling. Uh, Okay, so can we confirm, so there, therefore, in fact, uh, at least for weak enough coupling, apparently there's no relevant operators that could uh, disrupt this uh, Luttinger liquid plus uh, Ising phase. So can we confirm numerically that this is the right phase? Uh, so again, we can calculate the finite size spectrum. So again, these are uh, even, uh, this, this is the excitation spectrum uh, with any periodic boundary conditions in the even sector. This is the odd even uh, energy, which can be positive or negative. The ground state is alternating between even and odd fermion parity. So this is what happens as a function of length for some fixed value of parameters. So this looks like a, uh, uh, some sort of very strange uh, chaotic uh, pattern. But actually, uh, this is precisely what is predicted uh, by the theory. So uh, the important point is that there's kind of an induced Fermi. There was no characteristic Fermi wave vector in the problem because we didn't have any conserved uh, particle number. But uh, a Fermi wave vector sort of came out of nowhere. So uh, at, at the same point that we kind of uh, a U1 symmetry emerged, uh, a Fermi wave vector emerged also. And this Fermi wave vector will change in some continuous way with interaction strength. So uh, if we have an incommensurate Fermi wave vector, then in fact we expect such a chaotic uh, spectrum of uh, finite size states. And in fact, uh, actually, so uh, the, the, uh, the, the various symbols are numerical calculations of finite size uh, spectrum, and the lines are theoretical predictions based on the uh, uh, Dirac plus uh, Ising phase. And we get rather good agreement. And uh, in fact, some of the excitations are actually in the uh, Dirac sector, some are in the Luttinger liquid sector, and we represented these here by different colors. So it was actually quite challenging to interpret the spectrum. But at the end of the day, we realized that in fact uh, it was explained rather nicely by this uh, Luttinger liquid plus uh, Ising phase. And uh, we have uh, you know order 100 or 200 uh, excited states here as we vary the length or ratios of energy gaps, and they're predicted actually by four parameters. So there's a velocity V0 in the Ising sector. There's a velocity V in the Luttinger liquid sector. There's a kind of a spontaneously induced Fermi wave vector K0. Uh, and finally, there's this interaction strength parameter K, Luttinger parameter in the Luttinger liquid sector. So it turns out we can fit all the data quite nicely with just four parameters. So we're fitting uh, order 100 uh, uh, points with four parameters. So I think it's a fairly convincing fit. Uh, and these are, this is how the parameters uh, behave. Uh, as we uh, basically uh, reduce T, so we go into stronger and stronger uh, coupling regime. So uh, what happens as we go towards strong coupling? Do we actually go into a broken symmetry phase? Well, it, it's instructive to look at what happens to the wave vector K0, which is actually going to uh, pi over 4, uh, and also uh, look at what happens to the Luttinger parameter, which is going from order 1, corresponding to non-interacting fermions, down to very small values, corresponding to very strong repulsive uh, interactions. So uh, there's one other uh, interaction around, which I've ignored so far, uh, which uh, might come into play when we go uh, to strong enough uh, coupling. Uh, and this is actually an interaction that involves uh, two Majoranas, uh, four Dirac operators, and involves derivatives. So uh, it's, uh, depending on the value of k, it tends to be highly irrelevant as dimension 1 plus 4k. And k is 1 for non-interacting fermions, so this would be dimension 5. But as we reduce k down to 1 quarter, uh, this actually becomes relevant. Furthermore, this is actually oscillating in a wave vector 4k0 minus pi. So uh, this interaction could be dropped from the low energy theory 
unless k0 was pi over 4. But what we found numerically was that as we uh, crank up the coupling constant, k0 approaches pi over 4, and it seems to happen at precisely the same point where the Luttinger parameter approaches 1 quarter. So uh, it seems to be that there's a critical uh, coupling constant at which suddenly uh, this interaction uh, stops oscillating and becomes relevant uh, and could, could produce a gap. Uh, and once we go into the gap phase, it's going to give expectation values for both gamma right, gamma left, and psi left dagger, psi right. Uh, this leads to oscillations with a vector pi and uh, pi over 2. And this would correspond to a length 4 unit cell fourfold degenerate ground state, which is what I predicted by my hand waving uh, at the beginning. So this is actually appears to be a generalization of the commensurate and commensurate transition. There's some very nice work on this problem by Schultz and by Haldane uh, for the spinless fermion model. So this is some sort of generalization of that transition to uh, Majorana fermions. And again, it's sort of characterized by, uh, as we vary interaction strength, um, the density of particles can sort of change continuously, and then we can kind of lock into a commensurate uh, density, uh, uh, which, which might correspond to a gap phase. So something that rather analogous is happening here, and uh, I think it's very interesting that uh, k0 goes to pi over 4 at exactly the same point where this interaction becomes relevant, so very reminiscent of uh, theory of the commensurate and commensurate transition in uh, Dirac fermion systems. So as promised, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, connections with uh, STM. So uh, supposing that uh, we were actually able to make uh, this system, so we have a bunch of uh, uh, vortices uh, on top of a, the superconducting uh, layer uh, on top of uh, a, a strong topological insulator. Now suppose we were able to do uh, STM measurements so we could uh, uh, try to tunnel uh, electrons uh, in, into the core of the vortex. Uh, so, uh, how do we expect the uh, tunneling current to behave as a function of voltage? Uh, well, this is determined by the self-correlation function of the Majoranas uh, in time domain. So, uh, in the Ising phase, uh, this simply scales like 1 over t. This corresponds to a constant density of states, uh, and therefore predicts a tunneling current uh, which will be linear uh, in voltage. We also have to take into account the density of states in the tip, STM tip, but we assume that's also uh, is constant. Uh, at the tricritical Ising point, ag again assuming low frequency Green's functions are dominated by low energy excitations, uh, we now predict a non-trivial uh, exponent. The current should now vary as, as a fractional power of V uh, to the 7 fifths. So uh, we can actually relate the, uh, the, the time uh, exponents to the spatial exponents. So we, we can actually, the 7 fifths occurring here is actually related to the 1 over X to the 7 fifths behavior of the equal time correlation function. I showed you earlier that that in fact fit nicely the numerical uh, simulation. So we have some numerical evidence for this uh, 7 fifth. As I mentioned, if, if we go to the positive G side corresponding to attractive interactions, uh, we get a gap in the density of states. So we can actually predict the gap scales uh, with an exponent, uh, which we can calculate as a function of G minus G critical. And for also, as I mentioned, once we go into the gap phase, we're actually in a supersymmetric massive phase. So uh, if we now tunnel uh, an electron into the sample, uh, we're basically measuring the energy of a fermionic uh, excitation uh, in the sample. Uh, but we also have a corresponding bosonic excitation. And because of supersymmetry, the fermion and the boson have the same mass or the same energy gap. So the supersymmetry actually predicts that the energy to tunnel in a fermion would actually be the same as the energy to tunnel in a Cooper pair. So the Cooper pair can sort of go in and produce a boson, or an electron can go in and produce a fermion. And because of supersymmetry, these have the same energy. Or alternatively, we could make a particle hole excitation, also a bosonic, perhaps by uh, absorbing a photon, uh, and this would also have the same energy. So the prediction is that there would be equal energy gaps for uh, basically electron tunneling, Cooper pair tunneling, or uh, particle hole uh, excitations. So this would be a, an actual experimental uh, indication of the supersymmetry uh, in this phase. If we go to the uh, negative G side corresponding to repulsive interactions, uh, at the Lifshitz point where the velocities vanish, uh, the current should scale as the power of e to the one-third. Uh, you might ask, well, what happens in this Luttinger liquid plus Ising phase where we have two types of gapless excitations? Well, perhaps disappointingly, the Ising excitations dominate and will give a current proportional to v. So you might ask, is there any uh, uh, direct indication of, of the, uh, the Luttinger liquid part of the Hilbert space? And in particular, could we measure somehow the Luttinger parameter? Well, it turns out if we could do uh, STM measurements near the end uh, of a chain, uh, then uh, the tunneling current will depend on distance from the end of the chain as well as on voltage. Uh, and uh, actually, we, we expect that the tunneling current will have a term that oscillates uh, 
uh, as with a wave vector 2k0 as you move away from the end of the chain and decays with the power law and x which is determined by the Luttinger parameter k. And again we did a related uh, equal time correlation function calculation. So we calculated the uh, Majorana fermion correlation function uh, in the Luttinger liquid plus Ising phase and sure enough it oscillates at 2k0 and decays with an exponent which is related to Luttinger parameter k. So th this uh, decaying uh, STM current is kind of a uh, related to this, this behavior. So th there, there's my effort to make some connection with STM. Uh, let me uh, close by trying to make some connection with spin chains. Uh, so, well, one can make a jordan wigner transformation uh, on this model of uh, interacting Majorana and fermions, and one can actually map the problem exactly into a spin Hamiltonian. So uh, if we break by hand the symmetry, uh, then we actually get this type of term. So uh, if we only had T1 and T2, this would actually be the transverse fieldizing model, as we already mentioned. And if T1 equals T2, we're at the critical point of the transverse fieldizing model. But uh, the interaction terms add some less familiar uh, terms. So here's a kind of a product of transverse fields, and, and uh, here's a sort of a second neighbor uh, Ising type interaction. So uh, in fact, th this is a generalization of something called the ANI model or anisotropic next neighbor Ising model. So, so that's a kind of well-studied model in two dimensions. And you can write a sort of a quantum 1D chain version of this model. Uh, and this, in fact, I think if we drop one of these G terms, this actually corresponds to the ANI model. This is kind of a generalization of the ANI model. If you take the case where the T's are zero, we only have the G's, uh, we can make another transformation. We can actually write the model equivalently this way. So now we have a transverse field in the Z direction, and we actually have a four neighbor uh, Ising type interaction. And this model has also been studied before. Uh, and actually, it's related to the uh, four state POTS model. In particular, it has a large ground state degeneracy because if you only consider G2, uh, you can see there are actually eight different ground states. For example, four spins can be up, or you can have two up, two down, or up, down, up, down. Uh, so eight different ground states. Uh, and uh, G1 equals G2 is actually the self-dual point. Uh, and uh, based on the fact that the four-state POTS model uh, does not have a uh, uh, continuous transition, but a, uh, a first-order transition and a gap, there's another reason to expect that the model is gapped actually at, at the uh, point with translational symmetry, G1 equals G2, when uh, T1 and T2 are e equal zero. So this, this is further evidence for my hand-waving conjecture that we have a spontaneously broken symmetry, uh, at least in the limit of very strong coupling where we drop, drop the hopping terms. So uh, let me just uh, conclude by, by putting up this sketch of the phase diagram. OK, so first of all, we have an Ising phase that occurs around weak coupling in this model. Uh, if we go to positive G, which actually corresponds to attractive interactions, uh, we go up to some enormously large uh, coupling constant, not really to scale in this diagram, about 250, uh, where we have this tricritical Ising point. Uh, and then we go into this phase that actually uh, has a broken Z2 symmetry, two-fold degenerate ground state, and is actually supersymmetric, at least close to the critical point. So this is where you could actually probe supersymmetry. Uh, if you go to uh, negative G, corresponding to repulsive interactions, the Ising phase persists now down to a relatively small critical coupling. Then we go into this Ising plus Luttinger liquid phase. Uh, so this is a Lipschitz transition. And then we have this generalized commensurate and commensurate transition uh, into this uh, gapped fourfold degenerate state. So uh, for what looks like a rather simple, maybe the simplest possible model in a sense you could write down for uh, one-dimensional fermions, it has a rather rich and, and complex phase diagram, including a possible experimental realization of supersymmetry in a kind of novel, generalized, uh, commensurate, incommensurate uh, phase transition. And finally, uh, if you want to read more about it, we have a couple of preprints. So thanks for your attention.